G'day mate, welcome to episode 72 of the Exponential Performance Podcast. Today we're talking all things COVID-19, just like the rest of the world is at the moment. We're going to be talking about how we're going to get through this four-week lockdown that we find ourselves in in New Zealand, how to maintain that training and how to be neuroplastic with our thoughts so we come out the other end of it better or at least maintain what we've got. And we're also going to talk about consistent consistency in our training. Let's get into it. Welcome to the Exponential Performance Podcast. Join sports scientist and performance coach Maddie Graham to find out how to train smarter and maximize your performance no matter who you are. All right, g'day mate. Welcome to episode 72 of the Exponential Performance Podcast. It's so good to be back uh, for the podcast. It's been a while. It's been a long time, at least a couple of three, four months. Um, I know it doesn't seem like it for you because we just released episode 71, uh, it'll be last week now, but we had that one in the bank for a while, so it's been a while since Nick and I have actually sat down face to face and talked uh, just with all the craziness of the Southern Hemisphere summer season. We had a lot of people racing and a lot of uh, work on around that, and then obviously the crazy festive seasons and now we're sort of starting to settle back into it but obviously as people will be well aware there's a wee virus around the world at the moment causing a few issues and it's officially the first day of the New Zealand lockdown so we're in isolation everybody is not allowed to go out uh, and interact with anyone for four weeks so we thought what better time to catch up over the internet and uh, get into a podcast. So I guess the first part of our podcast is going to be around this whole COVID-19 situation and how we can make the most of it with our training. Um, But before we do that, Nick, I forgot you're there. How you doing, mate? Good, thank you. Good. Um, I'm sort of essentially on almost day three of my my self-isolation. We've been working from home for the last couple of days with work. Uh, and then have joined the country in the official lockdown as of this morning. Well, this morning, yeah. Absolutely, and I mean it's it's a lot of people sort of freaking out a little bit about it, or sort of making it into a pretty big deal. Not just the whole COVID nineteen thing, obviously a kind of a big deal. That's why we're shut down at the moment and locked down. But I kind of see it as a like an awesome opportunity, right? Uh, and I guess this is the first part of you know how we're going to deal with this with our training is that rather than looking at it as a, as a negative thing, uh, I think the the biggest thing is you approach it with uh, a positive uh, outlook on it. Uh, and I know it's going to be hard, and you know people around the world are going to die, but hopefully by you know isolating and and obeying the rules of the lockdown, uh, it it minimises it, and we get it over um, sooner. Then later, and I guess New Zealand, we're in a lucky p- position where the government's acted really quickly. Like, if you look around the world at other countries, I think they sort of locked the country down, and we were, you know, we were below 200 cases or something, wasn't it? Like that. So, I think uh, we're, we're sort of tackling it early, learning from other countries. So, hopefully, we um, we get through it uh, pretty quickly and with minimal impact. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's interesting. I've been thinking about it for the last few days, and for a very long time now, probably a good couple of years, I've, I've longed for having a decent like four weeks of just not having to do any like. There's no forced activities, no races, no events um, for me working on the way most weeks. So I get to be at home for four weeks minimum. Um, so it's actually really exciting. Um, you know, that I go through daunting patches of thinking, "Oh, I'm at home, not." not getting to see anyone, but at the same time, I've got a lot of things I want to do, a lot of books I want to read and, and bits around the house um, that now I have the opportunity to do. So like I said, it's all a, bit, a little bit about how you frame it from a mindset point of view, uh, whether it's a, a lockdown for four weeks or whether it's a, a chance to slow down for four weeks um, and, and ha- hopefully, like I said, help the country um, get over the, the virus. Absolutely. I think that mindset's a, a super important thing, right? So like, I posted something on 
Facebook the other day about seeing it as an opportunity for, for athletes from an athletic perspective, I guess, and that you don't have to be race ready for anything uh, in the next six months, essentially, because there's no races on. So you've got time to, to slow down, to do those things that you probably should have done uh, but haven't done because of the t- whole time thing. Um, you know, stretching, a bit of strength work, uh, working on that mobility, um, doing some good goal setting, all of those things that often get put on the back burner, um, ideal opportunity. And I think, like, people say, oh, you know, it's it's terrible, you know, we're not going to be able to go and do anything. And I kind of like, like, perspective is an awesome thing, right? So, like, we're looking at this whole situation that we have to stay in our houses. You can only sort of exercise. And we'll talk about a little bit more about that in our sort of immediate area. They don't want you going and doing stuff that could put, you know, the the emergency uh, system or the health system uh, stress it in this already stressful time for it. And it's kind of made me think, like, it's kind of, if you compare it to other things, it's like a, a holiday, right? So I thought about Anne Frank. You aware of Anne Frank, Nick? I am, yes. Yep. So uh, in Nazi Germany, obviously the Nazi virus was marching around Europe trying to kill a lot of people. And Anne Frank and her family went into essentially a lockdown, right? They hid in this annex of this uh, this complex where her father worked. And not just their family, but a couple of other um, people were in there with them. For two years, for two years, they hid in this kind of a small apartment complex, not being able to make any noise, not being able to go out at all. Um, You know, they snuck around at night time sometimes. Food was kind of a scarcity. uh, scarcity. No Netflix, no no TV, no internet. Uh, And... It kind of made me think, like, if that is if, that's, if that is kind of an, an extreme end of it, then it's kind of like, well, what we're doing at the moment is kind of like not even a thing that we should complain about a little bit. It's kind of that harden up principle, you know, of, you know, it's not actually that bad. Um, and, you know, we can still go out. We can go out. We can exercise. We've got this complete freedom that we live in, essentially. And I guess it shows you how free we once were. Like, if you think of life as it was, it was like, you could do anything you wanted. Uh, But now that we have to stay in our house and, you know, go out and exercise in the immediate vicinity of us, it's kind of a little bit uh, inconvenient, if anything. Uh, But when you compare it to the likes of uh, Nazi Germany and, you know, being a Jewish, Jewish family that's hiding out for their life in a little apartment, to you know, prevent getting captured and killed. It seems like a like probably shouldn't even be a podcast segment. <laughs> no, <clears throat> perspective, like you said, is a fantastic, fantastic grounding tool. I think in, in situations like this. Um, yeah. You know, yes, we've we are stuck at home, but I can still walk downstairs and jump on a a Zwift bike race and join people from around the world, or I can still take my dog for a walk around the block. Or I can still go to the supermarket, you know, and, and limitations we've still got access to food. People are still making food. People, there are still people working and, and kind of creating this life for us. Um, they're just saying, look, limit what you can, when you can, um, for the greater your country. Um, and I do quite like the uh, the concept that this is kind of a way that the earth can kind of heal itself a little bit um, for the amount of shit we've been putting into it with air travel and, and so forth over the past years and years. Mm, like uh, another it's a great opportunity isn't it and um jumping back to nazi germany for a split second uh and i'm not too sure some of you guys might have read uh victor frankl's victor frankl was a a a jewish guy who was again in nazi germany uh and was put into auschwitz the concentration camp and actually came out the other side of it uh and he wrote a book man's uh, search for meaning amazing book if you haven't read it but there's just a little quote from him that and it, it's, it's an amazing uh, quote, thinking of the situation that it's coming from, right? So when you can no longer change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. And so if uh, a Jewish person who's in a concentration camp can have that uh, ability to think like that, I can't change the situation, I've got to change myself to deal with the situation, then you know, anything that COVID-19 throws at uh, a 
a, a healthy person who's just sitting in their house uh, or is in, in lockdown, again, kind of feels like it shouldn't even be a thing we're talking about because it's not a big deal at all in comparison to those things. Um, but I think that's where we need to be at the moment. It's just changing ourselves, changing our perspectives of things and how we're going to tackle it. And that's what we're going to dive into uh, now is what are some of the uh, what are some of Nick Taylor's key things for getting through uh, the COVID nineteen lockdown? Uh, probably high on my list would be to have a have some sort of daily plan. Um, and I'm sure you know probably ninety eight percent of our listeners are the sort of people that will have something like this anyway. But even if it, you know if you're not working because you're not considered an essential service, having had some sort of daily plan right, I'm going to get out of bed at X time. Um, you know, you might choose to have the next four weeks as a good way to catch up on some rest. So you might say, I'm not going to set my alarm for six o'clock in the morning. You're going to set it for seven or eight. But you're getting out of bed at a set time and you're doing a couple of set things to start off the day in some sort of routine pattern, um, whether it be some sort of meditation, a bit of reading, a coffee with some loved ones or, or making some breakfast or, or just something simple. But it's a, a routine that you're getting done on a daily basis. And that kind of hopefully will set you up for actually achieving something in the day. Um, I think it was a really big trap for the people in the next four weeks just to feel like they're sitting around at home watching Netflix, feeling a bit slobbish. And then it's a very hard cycle to kind of break once you're into that sort of downward spiral, from a, especially from a mood point of view. Uh, I, in New Zealand, especially if we start heading into a bit more winter-like weather. Um, getting outside. Um, so ideally we're not going to have winter. I mean, it's bright sunshine outside at the moment where I am, but if you can get outside, especially in the middle of the day, and get some sun on your skin, get some vitamin D in the system, that can really help with the mood. Um, and vitamin D has also been one of the sort of the wonder vitamins that's come out of the last sort of couple of months of, of uh, COVID-19. is a, a really nice kind of help antiviral type of product to help the body manage and, and sort of stop the spread of a virus. So getting out to some midday sun is a really cool option. Um, and then... I think one thing that's really inspired me, I've got no small children myself, but I know you do, Matty, um, is seeing people talking about, you know, trying to get their kids to draw some pictures and drop them off to some local elderly neighbours or taking them somewhere where you can from a, a movement point of view, um, just to spread a bit, of, a bit of kindness and a bit of happiness to people that could potentially be by themselves at this time, um, to let them know that there are the community still thinking of them. Um, yeah, so that'd be a couple of the bigger things. Yeah. yeah, I just got off a um, like a two-hour-long video meeting today, with um, and another hour yesterday with in in terms of the work that I do with High Performance Sport New Zealand, and so there's been some pretty big uh, developments in the last couple of days, not just sort of in the local racing community, but sort of internationally as well with the whole you know Tokyo Olympics being postponed. I mean, we're talking about the best athletes uh, in the country, you know, in the world. Olympic level athletes, the approach uh, from our leading medical staff and training staff, and that the next four weeks essentially don't really matter too much. And in the, in the scheme of things, if we think about it, don't really matter. The key things uh, is that we keep uh, keep everybody active for health. All right, so we want to keep active for health, but we're not really too worried about uh, training for performance over this over this next time. Because if we try and push that too hard, then it has the potential to put a strain on our medical system at the same time. And I've seen quite a lot of discussion around this online uh, and some of the like the mountain running uh, groups where people are saying, well, can I go for a run um, you know, on my local trails? Or can I go for a run in the mountains? Or can I go and do big runs elsewhere? And... It's sort of, there was everyone was saying, you know, you definitely can because you just got to keep two metres away from everyone and everything's fine. So initially there was this thought from, from everyone and myself that pretty much we're going to be able to continue training as normal. You know, you can go for a drive and go for a run or you can drive down to the lake and go for a kayak. And then it kind of came out in no uncertain terms that, no, you can't do that. You can't drive anywhere because that becomes non-essential travel. So then after rejigging all the training programs once for closed gyms, I then went back and rejigged everyone's training programs again for, no, we can no longer, you know, drive and, and kayak 
or drive and run. Everything's got to be kind of local because they don't want people moving around because, again, that just puts an extra strain on our emergency services if something was to happen. And then that was really reinforced by our high-performance sport um, medical team in that they don't want people training hard because, again, that puts a strain on the medical system. If someone's to sprain an ankle or tweak their back or all of this other stuff that often happens when you're you know, training at a high level, um, then that becomes an issue again. Who is going to help those people? It's someone that's you know, potentially helping someone that's you know, got a virus and is actually in a life and death situation. Uh, and then flip side to that, if an athlete is training really hard, then their immune system gets compromised as well. So if you're out there doing a lot of uh, training, especially endurance training, our immune system is compromised, uh, which opens us up to susceptibility to, to illness. And with the current virus that's floating around, we probably don't want to open ourselves up to susceptibility to that. So sort of the general idea is that we want to keep moving. Uh, and I guess the nice word for it is maintenance. We want to maintain as much fitness as we can over this time. Um, but I, I honestly think if you approach this uh, time right, you can come out of it in really good nick. Like in terms of if we're talking about aerobic fitness, you can come out of this uh, with a very good aerobic fitness base just by training locally. If we're talk, talking strength, you can come out of it with a very good strength base, especially for an endurance athlete who doesn't often put a lot of time into their strength. If we're talking mobility, you can come out of this uh, as mobile as anything, uh, especially, again, for endurance athletes that don't often put much time into that. But I think we need to just be really conscious of, um, you know, sticking into those guidelines because the last thing we want to do is put unnecessary strain on anyone. For what reason? Because we're trying to get ready for a race that is in six months' time. I mean, if Olympic athletes can, you know, have that ability to say, okay, we're just going to dial things back here. There's no pressure. We're just going to train to maintain. We're going to get through these next four weeks, and then we can go from there. I think if they can have that clarity in mind, then I think most people listening to this podcast should be able to as well. Mm, absolutely, especially when, I mean, in New Zealand and Australia, where it is literally going to be six months probably until the first races start popping back up, touch wood that everything goes smoothly between now and then. And you know, there's no point in coming out at the end of these four weeks, right, okay, I'm ready to race tomorrow because there's going to be mm. nothing to do. So you might as well utilise yeah, utilize the, the downtime essentially to, to ease back on things a little bit, ease back on the intensity, do your mobility, get some strength stuff going. Um, you know, For me, I really want to get back into some really good core work, which I just keep neglecting, and some mobility stuff, which I keep neglecting. Um, so that will become a bit of the focus for me over the next four weeks um, is that sort of area. Yeah, absolutely, and, and a great opportunity to do that as well because it's mm. not taken away from anything else um, that you've got going on. No. And you mentioned, Nick, that you've got uh, your Zwift trainer set up and you're doing a little bit of – are you doing the Monday night racing on that? Yep. Yeah, I had the, I joined the first Monday Night Racing group la, this week, um, and they've had issues with trying to organise a a race on Swift that's not run by Swift itself. Uh, um, yeah. I don't really understand the back end, so it was just a group ride um, that they kind of said, look, you can treat it like a race if you want to. Um, so that was good fun to to kind of ride alongside people that you know, um, and then a couple of a couple of mates have done a few other races um, and a couple of rides as well. Um, together that way um, I mean we could still potentially be outside riding individually at the moment from home you know like you said go and do a bit of a ride um, but I know overseas and in Europe especially they've, they've started to crack down on that as well um, because it's sort of encouraging people to get into groups but also this whole you know you could be 20 k's from home on a local ride mm -hmm. and fall off your bike break your leg um, and then all of a sudden you're placing a strain on that medical system which doesn't need it at this stage so I've got a few mountain bike skills that I've sort of written a list about, like manualing and bunny hopping and those sort of things that I could do on my driveway or, you know, go down to the local store and do something. Um, and that, for me, will be my outside riding, I think, for the next wee while, um, and then focus on, on just inside riding um, and some strength and core stuff at home. 
Yeah, awesome. And in terms of a strength setup, like what of uh, what would be your sort of setup at home uh, for someone? Let's say no equipment. What are we going to do? We've got no equipment. What can we do to keep uh, ourselves uh, strong? Yeah, I mean, no equipment's kind of cool because that's like almost a raw base. Like you've got to you've got to be resourceful at every possible outcome. And there's so much body weight stuff. I guess is the the early uh, the easy part to start with. Mm. Um, You've got like, steers. Most people might have a steer. You've got the curb outside on the footpath. You can do just for calf raises, um, or you could find some steers at the local primary school. Um, if there's one close by, run down there and do some stuff on the steers. Um, anything in the pantry that's got a little bit of weight to it, you know, a couple of cans of tomatoes or baked beans or whatever you've got, three-liter milk bottle, you know, fill it up with some water. Um, next time you're at the supermarket, yeah, buy it a big thing of milk or a big thing of juice, treat your staff some nice juice and then fill it up with water and there you've got a couple of kgs of weight that you could use for something. Um, but I think a lot of what you can achieve body weight wise is, is really just as good. I mean, having a, a small kettlebell or some small dumbbells is going to give you just a slight resistance, but being able to do it with some body weight, you can really refine that technique um, component. So then when you get back to doing something with a gym or, you know, you might be able to buy something online once some stores open up and you start adding some weight, your technique's really kind of nailed down. Um, and like you said, especially for endurance athletes who haven't been doing a lot of any in that kind of space, um, that's all they need to start with anyway. Um, you know, you don't want to be loading up with any sort of weight. Yeah, big time. And something that I've been doing um, quite a lot of and, like, suggesting to others is when we're training – let's say, at home, and the difference between, what's the difference between a workout and training, right? So, like, it's something that I, I always avoid the word workout because I don't like it. I don't like what it's come to mean And that workout's often something you go to the gym and do in a fitness class or whatever it might be, and it's all about burning energy, right? The whole idea is to end really hot and sweaty uh, and with with no energy, and I understand that people use the word workout when it comes to specific sport training as well. But I don't I don't like it. So I always use the word training session, right? And what's the difference between a workout and a training session? Well, training session apart opposed from just the end goal being burning energy, it's to prepare you for a specific thing, has a specific outcome to it. Burning energy is just sort of a byproduct of it, but are we working on developing, you know, strength or is it developing our endurance or specifically preparing for X event? So I always try and use the word training session uh, just as a side note. So what I've been doing a lot of and, and sort of train, uh, prescribing for others at home is to do quite slow strength movements. Okay, so especially through the eccentric component of the movement. So if you think of a bicep curl, um, just because it's an easy thing to think of, when your arm's out straight at the bottom and you curl it up to your shoulder, your fist up to your shoulder, that part of the movement's called the concentric phase of the movement. When you lower that weight back down... That's called the eccentric phase. So the muscle, your bicep, is lengthening as it's been loaded. Now what we can do is manipulate the amount of time your muscle spends in each of those, those phases. And it's been found a lot of good evidence around using uh, accentuated eccentrics, so putting more time and effort into the eccentric movement uh, so slowing down the lower in terms of the bicep curl uh, for developing strength. So we can take that and apply it to our body weight exercises as well because we don't necessarily have lots of weight we can find around the place potentially. But if we were doing a squat, for example, then we could lower slowly for five seconds. A lot of people, and especially if you look on Instagram, there's all these home workouts uh, coming on board now with the whole COVID-19 home home workout sort of situation and so what they'll do is they'll be doing all of these lunges or all of these squats all these push-ups at a very fast intensity because what are they trying to do they're trying to burn energy and it looks it looks a lot better on instagram rather than someone slowly doing a squat and so 
by slowly lowering, let's say over five seconds, then we're actually able to expose uh, our, our quads, our muscles that are doing the exercise, our glutes, to a longer what's called time under tension. And that helps with developing um, our strength. So you don't necessarily need a lot of weight, but by manipulating the tempo at what you do at which you do the exercise, you can actually get quite a lot of strength benefits just from that. And so if you're doing push-ups, go slowly on the way down and even slowly on the way up. Give a five second push up a go. So starting at the top, lower down for five, hold at the bottom for five, still keeping uh, tension on the muscles, not sitting on the ground, and then push up for five. So it takes 15 seconds to do one push up. You do 10 of those and uh, that's pro probably enough for you for, the, for that set anyway. So there's lots of different, way, different ways we can manipulate uh, those training variables uh, rather than just punching out heaps of reps um, at, on, at, our, at our body weight. Yeah, those 15-second push-ups are ridiculously hard, aren't they? Like when you, you, know, you think, yeah, I'll jump down, I'll do 20 push-ups, and then you jump down and try and do 15-second push-ups, and you get through four or five, you're like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> this is going to yeah. suck. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah, so it's a really cool, especially... Especially push-ups and squats, even um, isometric holding, like you said, holding it at the bottom for five seconds, mm -hmm. or sitting on a like a wall sit, um, yep. so sort of sitting against a wall with your back flat on the wall, knees out at ninety degrees, and sit there. You know, you're not actually sitting on anything, but supporting your body weight um, and holding it for as long as you can. Um, prone holds are another example, I guess, of an isometric contraction, just really tight, tensing your muscles and holding on tight um, for as long as you can. Yeah, absolutely. And I think with the prone hold as well, rather than doing it, well, feel free to do it however you want, but doing it as long as you can, it's kind of like the, tr the traditional way, right? So people will jump down there and like do a five-minute prone hold, and yeah, it worked really hard. When we think about strength, though, strength is about maximal activation of muscle fibers and the sort of nerves that lead to them. And we need, and the, the way you develop strength traditionally is by lifting something heavy because to lift something heavy, you need to activate as many muscle fibers or what we call motor units, which is the, motor, uh, the, the muscle fiber and the nerves leading to them. We need to recruit as many of those as possible. So by lifting heavy things, we sort of naturally get that. But the other way we can get that is, like you said, Nick, in that isometric option is working as hard as we can but not going anywhere because you're sitting against a wall, okay, and you're just maintaining that position. With the prone hold, rather than just sort of hanging out there, because after about that 30-second mark, the, the muscle activation doesn't really change. We're just getting that strength endurance type uh, work. So if you can imagine you're down on in the prone hold position, but you've got your hips on the ground and you're relaxed, and then you push up into the prone hold position, but rather than just holding it there for two minutes, just hold it there for 10 seconds, but during that 10 seconds, maximally contract every single muscle in your body. So I'm talking like your glutes, your obviously your abdominals, uh, squeezing through your quads, squeezing through your arms, your forearms, try and relax your face and your neck, uh, but everything else just maximally squeezing for 10 seconds and then relax for five seconds and then come back up and again squeeze ease everything you can for that 10 seconds and then relax again and then come back and relax for five seconds and come back up and go again for another 10 seconds as hard as you can and it's amazing how much uh like effort you can put in when you're just focusing on just contracting every single muscle fiber that you possibly can really really good way to do a prone hold if you can hold for a couple of minutes on your prone hold after that time, it's probably not really doing much for you anyway. You've got your strength to a level uh, where, you know, it's no longer effective. So you need to change something. I know a lot of people, you know, they do their standard three-minute prone hold. It's probably not doing anything for them because they're so used to it. But, yeah, give that a go. Report back. I think we should also request some facial selfies, like your 10-second straining <laughs> face, because yeah, that was that was good. I'll be sending if you if you want to see the ten second uh, straining selfie, jump over onto YouTube because remember we are putting this uh, live recording on YouTube as well. Yeah. <laughs> Bit of not entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to seeing yours. Yeah. <laughs>
Uh, so I guess just as a bit of a wrap up around COVID-19, what are we looking to do? M- maximise the opportunity, uh, stay safe, uh, make sure we don't put any pressure on the medical system, uh, maintain fitness if anything, um, but probably not going to be able to build any great aerobic fitness at this stage due to the health risk of us getting sick uh, and then just the practicality of it. But there's no reason not to um, come out of this uh, four-week lockdown you know, worse than we were. We can definitely maintain or at least get somewhat better in some aspects, maximise those areas where we don't usually put our effort into. Yeah, and I think if any athlete and, you know, recreational and above come doesn't come out of this kind of four-week period without some sort of plan that they want to apply when they are allowed to get back out and do stuff and races do start to be um, put back on the calendar, then you've kind of wasted the best opportunity you're ever going to get to, to revise and plan and, and work out a bit of a structure that you can then lo- lock into some dates when they're, they're put back on a calendar. Mm, absolutely. I um, mean, remember, this is uh, not Nazi-occupied Europe. Um, we don't have to hide away in our houses, um, you know, for two years. It's only four weeks. We've got such an awesome opportunity. Uh, so take advantage of it, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. To give you a bit of a hand on that, we've got the indoor cycling, the top secret indoor cycling file over on the Exponential Performance uh, website and also the Performance Temple handbook package. Uh, and we've got a 50% discount on both of those um, just to help you with one, some just general reading with the Performance Temple around your goal setting, your planning. Um, and looking at addressing those four performance pillars. And then obviously the top secret indoor training uh, cycling file is for, it's got 10 different indoor training sessions that you can do on your wind trainer. If you don't have a Gucci Zwift uh, set up and you don't, you're not on that bandwagon yet, there's still some old school cycling indoor sessions that you can do uh, on any old wind trainer or spin bike. So the, Discount code to get 50% off there is just COVID-19. Um, and I'll post a link to that in the show notes as well. And that'll be over at exponentialperformancecoaching.com slash 72 for obviously episode 72. Nick, what have you got next for us? Uh, well, we've kind of touched on a little bit of that through our conversation just before, but I wanted to, to raise the concept of neuroplasticity, uh, which is a slight mouthful to say. But... Essentially what neuroplasticity is referring to is the, the brain's capacity to kind of reorganize and uh, adopt to, uh, different patterns, different movement patterns that we are um, doing in our life. But, and probably the easiest thing to consider throughout this whole week chat is around maybe a squat because everyone knows roughly what a squat looks like. But it's not a natural pattern. We do have to learn it. If we're in the gym setting, we don't, can't start with 100 kgs. We have to build up. So... Essentially, how movement is, I guess, produced by the body, we have grey matter in our brain and spinal cord, and that is sending out messages to our muscles. Um, Now, that's a very, very simplistic term. Uh, There's a whole bunch of finer details that happen in between those two ends, but that's for another, a very scientific deep dive. So we've got the grey matter that's sending out these electrical impulses to our muscles, and that's causing movements to happen. Now, when we start to, to learn a, a movement, um, again, using the squat, things happen pretty quick. We recruit more and more muscle fibers to make that movement more and more efficient pretty quickly. Um, so it's a bit of an exponential curve to start with. Things are rising really quickly in terms of our ability to move more weight and move more efficiently. And then it reaches a certain point where things start to plateau off a little bit more um, as our body's starting to sort of say, well, okay, we're at, at efficiency here. Um, and you might say, okay, we've increased weight from just using a barbell on our shoulders. Let's say you've added up 20, 30, 40, 50 kgs, and then you think, actually, now 55 is not that easy, um, and then you sort of spend a good couple of weeks working away at 55, and then you're starting to step up in little chunks um, as your body's slowly recruiting more and more uh, muscle fibers to make that um, a little bit easier for us. The reason for kind of that slowdown is the body basically starts to use a a use it or lose it kind of principle. So if you take 
three or four weeks out of your gym routine and you go back, it's going to be a little bit harder to lift the same weight that you left it on. So let's say you left it 100, um, you give it three weeks not doing anything, you come back, 100 is going to feel pretty rough. Um, your movement patterns may be a little bit, a little bit wonky, your technique may not be perfect at 100, so you have to drop down and then build back up again. So one way to kind of negate that is to make sure these sort of these main movements, for, especially for your sport that you like, is they always always been done in some respects, whether it be in the gym or out of the gym at home. So we've got this next kind of four week period, at least where we can't get to a gym, and most of us don't have a home gym set up. So we have to keep our movement patterns going to some extent. You know, if you're a, a cyclist, things like your squat is a lot more important. Um, just like two for runners, you know, single leg squats and calf raises and those sort of things are movements that you might not be able to completely do through your sport. So we have to find some way to kind of keep those patterns moving at home. So free squats, um, you know, like I said earlier, calf raising on the side of the curb is an option as well to get that movement pattern, get some loading going on. One thing to be careful of, and this, again, this four weeks is probably the best time you're ever going to have to correct bad technique is every time we repeat a movement even if the technique is horrific then our body's going to get better at that movement in that horrific position so if you're used to squatting and you're used to popping your back up so you've got a nice curved back which is very very bad for your back and very inefficient as a movement then that's where you're going to develop more strength um, and you're eventually going to get to the point where you damage your back because you've loaded up to the point where your back can't handle it anymore but if you've got a nice flat back and you're contracting your core as you're standing up, then you're always going to be able to load the weight because your body's in a braced position and, and sort of the, able to handle the load that's coming through it. So it's a really cool opportunity to basically start videoing yourself in these movement patterns, compare that to some online videos, or you can fire them our way for a little bit of um, critique. Um, tag us in them on Instagram or Facebook. Um, and we can critique your movements a little bit, especially for things like your squats and your deadlift patterns uh, that there are some pretty average videos online itself for. So that would be my recommendation for the next four weeks from a strength point of view is to get some of these movements down packed, you know, get your basic squat pattern, your basic one-legged squat, even things like stepping up onto a bench or a, a step or a seat. You know, you don't want your, your if your toes are on the, bench you don't want your knee to be skewed out one way and your hip the other way you want a nice line between knees hip and knees sorry toe knee and hip um, but the number of times you go into the gym and you see people their hips are all out the side because they don't have the right movement patterns or they're too tight in the hips and, or something like that so really cool opportunity to be diving into your own bodies uh, and working out your movement patterns and trying to create some better more efficient movement patterns through this this concept, I guess, of neuroplasticity. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And I guess as well, like <clears throat> you touched on, you know, our strength movements there as well, but great time as well to do some technique work on the bike if you've got an indoor trainer, you know, doing technique drills there, uh, out running especially, like it's often something that gets shunted to the side, you know, doing technique drills uh, when we're out running as well. Because our volume's not going to be the same, um, we can... We're not going to be able to, we're not having that same motor pattern happening all the time, so it's a great time to go and uh, make adjustments, uh, retrain, uh, and because we don't have anything coming up in the next six months, potentially, a great time to uh, reset things as well. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Um, I was going to do a segment continuing on from episode 71 uh, about our training peaks. Um, series but i'm going to leave that today i'm um, oh. just conscious of time because i know we've yeah, been sure. waxing on a little bit about a bunch of stuff but i just wanted to wrap up with uh, a segment around this concept of consistent consistency because uh, I, I feel it's really important and i've talked to a, quite a few of my athletes about it uh over the last about six months anyway and it's something that really hits home with a lot of them and I've noticed some big changes for those people that have actually started 
to implement this concept of consistent consistency. And I can see a lot of people listening and thinking, what the hell are you talking about? Wouldn't you just call it consistency? Is that not the same thing as consistent consistency? So I just want to make a bit of a differentiation because I, th I believe it's kind of important. But I think if you can nail consistent consistency or apply consistent consistency, and this is probably going to be one of the podcasts that has the most ever uses of the word consistent and consistency in the history of podcasts, because I'm going to say it a lot. But what's the difference between consistent consistency and let's say consistent inconsistency? So if you can imagine if someone's consistently inconsistent, these are the type of people that they can't even string a couple of weeks of training together. Every week they 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 train or they approach their program, they're missing sessions. They're consistently inconsistent with their training. What about consi inconsistently consistent? So the opposite, inconsistently consistent. So an inconsistently consistent person is someone that has, they say, right, I'm going to get back on the on the wagon. I'm going to get on this program. I'm going to actually smash it out. Uh, I'm going to revisit my base, and I'm just going to put this really big week. These, I'm going to get back on the program, so to speak. And they get back in their training, and they put in a, some really big weeks. And then something happens, and they fall off the wagon again. And then a couple of weeks later, like, right, this is it. I'm getting back on the program. This is this is my year now. Uh, I'll just give me the biggest program you can. And we, you know, I'm into it. And they put in some really big weeks, and they're going really well, and then they fall off the wagon again. So that's what I would say, they're inconsistently consistent. Whereas the person before, the consistently inconsistent one, is a... They're always just training, but they're always inconsistent with their training. So we don't want to be those two. We don't want to be the consistently inconsistent guy, or we don't want to be the inconsistently con consistent guy, because I don't think they give you very good results at all. And this is where it comes in, is the consistent consistency. You're always consistently training. Uh, you're doing the right sessions at the right time. Uh, and then it's all about, not necessarily putting in huge volumes, but if you're consistent with if you're consistently consistent with your training, it's about all of those little differences adding up over time to give you the result that you're after. And this doesn't just apply to training. I think it applies really importantly to nutrition. Same kind of concept. You'll see those people that are right, right, I'm gonna get on a nutrition plan. And then they go really consistent for a while and then they fall off the wagon. Or that person that is always just yo-yoing up and down, whereas the consistently consistent person, over time, small changes add up to give the result. Being consistently consistent is quite boring, right? It's just about doing the right thing all the time. Um, and But if you put in the effort at being consistently consistent, I think that's where all the results come from. You look at the most elite endurance athlete. Uh, they are not there because they put in a big month of training. One month out of 12 doesn't really make a big difference. But if you put in 12 months of training, that's where it comes from. And they're consistently consistent with those sessions that they do. Same thing with our stretching, our rolling, our mobility work. A one-off session doesn't do or... Uh, result in everything uh, in anything it is the consistently consistent application of rolling of stretching that gives us that mobility that we're after same can be applied for sleep as well uh, you know one good night of sleep doesn't fix uh, a consistently inconsistent sleep pattern and the the list just goes on in terms of where this can be applied, and not only with uh, our training either, but in, in other life as well, work, finances, relationship. Being consistently consistent is such an important thing across the board, I believe, um, but not wanting to get onto too much of a philosophical uh, talk here, but when it applies to training, if you want to be, if you want to meet your goal, whatever that might be, being consistently consistent is where it's at. And if you decide to take that 
and pop it into other places of your of your life, I can almost guarantee being consistently consistent is going to be the winner on the day. Well, over multiple days. Nick, thoughts on consistent consistency? No, probably the only thing I would say, I mean, we all know people that we've trained with in the past that, you know, they've done, they'll be doing 15 hours a week or 20 hours a week, whatever is a, a big week for someone in your sport and lifestyle. And then a couple of weeks later, they're doing, oh, you know, I'm sick or I've, no, I can't do anything, and that sort of a couple of weeks. And then a few weeks down the track, I'm oh, back to 15 hours, 20 hours a week, right around. Right. And then the person that's probably going to be doing probably maybe 10 hours a week, and they're just approximate numbers, but consistently across months and months, are, are going to be much more efficient in their metabolic processes, their technique, um, and therefore have a better event than the guy that's doing, yeah, 15, 20, 5, 2, 15, 20, 5, 2, um, all over the show. So yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Take take a, a reduction in, in volume to some extent if, if you can. Have a little bit of extra time for sleep, relationships, work, etc. And then the, the average of all of that across the the period of time, the six months, the year, the eighteen months, um, it will be much better off. Yeah, absolutely. And that's not saying that you need to train uh, really hard every single week. Otherwise, you're going to lose it. Um, that's just called good training or periodized training where we have load weeks and, and structured recovery weeks. So that's not what we're talking about here. But if you've got recovery sessions planned, you know, some people are pretty uh, inconsistently consistent about doing their or consistently inconsistent about doing their recovery sessions. You know, they'll see a recovery session there and they'll go, ooh, I might go do something else. <laughs> you know, so it, 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 um, it, it comes in both angles. Obviously, consistent training, but then you know, doing the correct training as well is important. But if I had to choose one thing that makes a great athlete, um, or a successful athlete, or not even a successful athlete, but someone who successfully achieves their goals, it's that person that's not only consistent, but is consistently consistent over time. Because it's easy to be consistent for a week. It's easy to be consistent for a month. When you've got to be consistently consistent over time, that's where the true magic happens. Well said. Well said. All righty, team. We're going to wrap up there for episode 72. For any of the resources that we mentioned today, especially those training plan discounts to give you a bit of a hand to get through this COVID-19 situation, uh, head over to exponentialperformancecoaching.com slash 72 for episode 72. Uh, and we will be back next week. We're going to be hitting some uh, more podcasts during this time. Uh, and we will pick up where we left off on our Training Peaks series, looking at the performance management chart next week, along with a bunch of other stuff. If you've got any questions for us, anything you'd like to be seen covered in the podcast, give us a shout over at the Exponential Performance Facebook page or email us or catch Nick over on Instagram. He is at its underscore a uh, underscore Nick's underscore life. Still at that. <laughs> and I am over at Matty EPC. Until next time. Get out there and train hard. But remember, train smart and stay safe out there. See you. Mate, thanks for listening. If you would like to support this podcast and see it continue into the future, you can do so in a number of ways. Firstly, make sure you subscribe to this channel on whatever platform you are listening like and share the podcast on social media to help spread the word. If you're feeling really generous, head over and leave a review and a rating over on iTunes. This helps spread the word and develop the podcast. All of this will help the podcast continue long into the future so we can keep bringing you the information you need to train hard, but most importantly, train smart.